Oh my God. <laughs> Michael, 54 years of ministry. Did you ever think you would do what we have done in the last 10 sessions? Well, we're going to see how this turns out. And I might just blame it all on you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if it turns out great, I'm going to take all the credit. Uh, no, this has been uh, something that uh, I just don't see how it could have happened without uh, previous experience of myself and Daniel both. Uh, and the, uh, there's just been a beautiful uh, synergy about this um, working together. And uh, we've certainly enjoyed it. I think it's going to be something that we and uh, hopefully others will enjoy for many years yet to come. We are getting to uh, ready to wrap this up. This is going to be our last session. It is going to include uh, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation. Mm. So um, uh, hang on to your hats. Or throw them away. We don't care which one you do. <laughs> uh, the, you, you may stand up and shout. You may try to keep your feet on the floor. Uh, whatever. Uh, this is the culmination uh, on this session of this uh, research into the pseudographicals. And as Daniel has uh, been very committed to uh, reminding you what a pseudographical is, we'll let Daniel explain one more time. What is a pseudographical? Pseudo, which means false. Graphic, which means a writing. So pseudo writings, a false writing. Uh, many times writings that have been added to another uh, another writer's uh, writing. Another writer's writing. Yeah, I said that right. <laughs> uh, after they have died. And uh, that's typical. <clears throat> Not always is it after they died. But in most cases, uh, it's a di additional writing that's added to yeah. someone else's writing after they have died. Yes. And what we've learned so far is they've, they've attempted to hijack the gospel, uh, come in and take a beautiful message and turn it into Catholicism. Well, and we have a 2,023 years of history to um, point to uh, as to the devastation. And uh, was this messed up? Well, it just all depends on how messed up history became. Uh, right immediately after that. We do know that the prophet uh, Isaiah and uh, Micah, I think it is, both uh, gave us the conclusion of the work of the cross, uh, which is, and they shall learn more no more. Mm. Uh, so uh, that is the thing that, that compels us is that this uh, ultimate uh, effect of the gospel has not been experienced on this planet. In fact, it swung wildly the other direction and seems that it uh, multiplied the wars and uh, all of these things that have uh, been a part of this as our chart has so uh, graphically um, been a symbol to uh, let you see this. Again, if you want to see this chart, just Google it. Um, uh, European uh, royalty uh, chart and uh, for Western uh, Europe. Uh, it is just amazing. I, I um, As I've gotten involved in doing research and uh, family research, uh, the fact of it is most of you guys out there come from the same lineage some way. It's just... Uh, it's just almost impossible that uh, the vast majority of, majority of you do not if you uh, live in Canada or the United States and your uh, main uh, ancestry uh, is uh, Caucasian. Uh, it really is just quite amazing what came out of France and uh, all of Western Europe, Italy. All of those were tied together. You see, when we look at them, we see them now as separate countries and everything. But uh, their number one uh, way of trying to end war was by marriage. Uh, and they married, uh, English married Italian and uh, and German and uh, goodness gracious, it was all over Western Europe that they were marrying each other. Norway, 
uh, uh, women who were daughters of the kings of Norway married the kings of England. And uh, uh, all the time there was these conquests uh, from different parts of the, the western part of Europe. And uh, even the Vikings that came in to uh, play into this. Uh, what happened is a tragedy to say the least. Uh, this may be the first news release, if you will, that has been uh, gathered and researched to say why in the uh, bigger picture of this, why this took place. And the one thing that we can tell you and affirm without any hesitation, all you have to do is click on Netflix. And I, I really encourage you to do this. Click on Netflix, click on Prime. Any one of these that have anything to do, and there's a lot of them out there now, it's really kind of a fetish for people to study these things about the uh, development of royalty. Um, uh, goodness gracious, you can see uh, Robert the Bruce, uh, William the Conqueror, Charlemagne, uh, many different uh, kings from many different parts of the world, the Stuarts who uh, ruled Scotland, and uh, all of these uh, different names, the Capetian dynasty that ruled uh, France uh, for over 300 years and that even in that uh, one of the uh, daughters of the Prince of Kiv which is a celebrated saint now of Kiv uh, she married into uh, the married one of the uh, the kings the Capetian kings during that 300 years and then, of course, their descendants married into the English. And uh, so it's, it's almost impossible to have any connection in this world of Western European royalty and not be connected to virtually all of them. Uh, just all depends on whether they are uh, grandparents, aunts and uncles or cousins, you know, that are coming down from wherever your particular line may have gone in. And all you need is one line going into this, and it's it really does include all of it. The difference between me and you is the fact that I know and you don't. And that's that to me that really is a very true statement. Uh, is that uh, it's it's just the knowledge of this. It's just almost impossible. Daniel, what did you look at? Uh, at and then uh, how many generations it required? How many? Grandparents, do you remember that? Um, I think it was 12 generations and it was something like 4,000 different uh, grandparents that were required. Yeah, so uh, over 4,000 people <clears throat> and I'm, I'm thinking it was 10 generations, but it, uh, 10 or 12, yeah, and, but either, either way, it doubles every year after that as it's doubled every year all the way back to. Uh, so uh, uh, 10,000 at uh, at. At 12th generation, 13th generation is uh, uh, more than 20,000. And then the next is 40. And uh, the next is uh, double that. Uh, it, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. This is absolutely crazy. So uh, what they've learned in studying genealogy is at some point this expansion going back actually begins to contract then again because all of us did come, uh, and this is true whether you are uh, a creationist or a evolutionist, it all begins to go back down and we all came from uh, one set of parents. You know our persuasion, we're not gonna get on that anymore. <clears throat> so we really are persuaded that this can be at least a part of facilitating uh, peace on earth. Uh, at least what we are doing is taking away the excuse of Jesus wants us to go to war, that God is on our side reason to go to war. Uh, we'll fight because uh, God is on our side. Uh, let me say this very clearly. God is on nobody's side in war. And, and uh, uh, after the death, burial, and resurrection, God was never on anybody's side. Now, if you read before 
the cross, you're going to see God was on certain people's sides. Uh, but that was by necessity because of predestination. And now uh, it's not possible that God would take sides in a war. There may be one that's just or unjust or whatever. I can certainly point out many wars that really were unjust. Uh, my second great-grandfather fought in the uh, Mexican-American War. And uh, most historians say it's probably one of the biggest uh, blemishes on American history that we, we started that war for one reason and one reason only, and that's to take the, uh, the area of Texas and uh, west of Texas uh, away from uh, Mexico. It was a land grab, and you just can't say that it was anything less than that. And my grandfather, he lost an eye in that war. We have the uh, documentation of his involvement he fought, he's an East Tennessee uh, boy that fought all the way to Mexico City. So, uh, and, and all of you have this wrapped up. Uh, the reason the ten uh, Tennessee is the volunteer state is because of that war. Uh, the federal government asked for 3,000 volunteers and Tennessee produced 30,000. And my second great grandfather was one of those 30,000. And that's the reason we call this the volunteer state. Uh, so, uh, we're trying to help the brain grasp the big picture. And then also at the same time, we want you to see the minutia of this that has to be unraveled for the future to be different from the past. Uh, I know we must agree that the future must be different from the past. The reason that most people step into a, the end of the world is coming is because if we keep doing things the way we've done in the past, it, this is just not a, a tenable situation. Uh, even though we are doing better than we have uh, in, in times past. Uh, but doing better is not good enough. We need to advance to a point to where that there's a way to resolve conflict the gospel includes conflict resolution because an angry God is no longer angry. And so it's very important that that stay in the gospel. The gospel of peace must stay because that is the gospel. And uh, that is the thing that would, the only thing that can translate from what God has done to what we can do now is, uh, is from the template of that change of mind, change of person, of God himself, uh, to where that there was a cessation of hostilities. So we're looking for that cessation of hostilities, uh, goodness, all the way down to the micro level and to the macro level also. Uh, Daniel, let's take on John. Oh boy. I think these books that we're about to go in are some of the books that have been used the most mm. by Christianity to condemn people. And if we can lift that burden a little bit, I think we would have accomplished a great and wonderful thing. And it's been used by kings and authorities to kill people. <clears throat> yep. Uh, first John, um, you know, I, I, I always think it's funny that, uh, this John, there's this thing between John and the other apostles. Uh, listen to this, verse 1. That which we have from the beginning, which we heard, which we have seen with yeah. our own eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. Uh, there was kind of this subtle thing that we see uh, between all of the apostles and Paul. Yeah. Uh, the apostles were always bragging that they walked with Jesus, they talked with Jesus, they saw Jesus. And Paul said, yeah, but I spent three years out in the wilderness. <laughs> With the resurrected Christ. With the resurrected Christ. Yeah. Yeah, and... yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, um, as we go on here, uh, Michael, this verse, and we have mentioned it a few times already in the conference, uh, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all righteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Uh, and if you read this, it goes one way and then back the other and back the <laughs> other and then the one way. I mean, you, your head really does begin to spin with the statements made here. 
there is no other place in the Bible except in James that talks about confession of sin mm. uh, on this side of the cross. James actually had the audacity to say that your sins would be forgiven just through the laying on of hands uh, for the sick uh, from elders. Uh, we know you don't even get healed, much less get your sins <laughs> forgiven by, go ahead, call them, you know, uh, unless you've got a headache that can uh, pseudo go away or an ache or a pain that can pseudo go away. Uh, the elders have never healed anybody. Let us make that very clear. I am done with the days of trying to make room for the ridiculous and for trying to keep from uh, harming the conscience of those who think that they have experienced these things. Because I thought I experienced these things too. Daniel thought he experienced these things too. But an honest look at them makes us accept the fact that these were not real. Mm -hmm. uh, these things uh, did not happen. As we said, we had to leave out a little truth uh, or we had to add a little bit or just coincidence. If you pray about everything, uh, some things are gonna turn out all right. <laughs> and that's basically the function of this whole thing that makes it seem like it works because people get in a mindset, they, a life of prayer uh, mindset, and therefore they think that everything that turns out right is a result of prayer. Mm. And yet the people that don't pray at all have uh, the same amount of things uh, uh, basically turning out right as the others do. In fact, the ones that don't pray because they're out trying to get things done and make things happen, whereas a person praying may not do that, could actually possibly have even more things turning out right for them than praying people. Yeah. So as we go down through this, uh, you know, uh, chapter two is just devastating. Uh, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, who is the propitiation uh, for our sins and not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. This propitiation for sin is taught nowhere. Uh, Jesus is not there waiting on you to ask forgiveness again and again and again and again. In fact, Hebrews makes it very clear that sin has been done away with. Paul's teachings makes it very clear sin has been done away with. And, uh, I, and I've told you the story even in this conference of going through that one moment when I took that breath of air in to expel it with, please, Lord God, please forgive me for my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And I'd been learning until I came to that point, and it was such a drastic point. It seems silly now when I look back on it, but it certainly wasn't silly then that I actually allowed a breath to escape my lungs that was drawn in to confess sins, but was exhaled without doing it. Bam. Wow. It still impacts me uh, to think about that moment. And uh, the freedom, the, the joy, uh, I... I cannot tell you uh, the issue of being freed from confession of sin, but I could only be freed from the confession of sin if I knew I had truly been freed from sin. And uh, this tells you that if you do sin, you're not of God, and uh, it, anybody that's born of Christ can't sin, but if you do sin, we still have an advocate with the Father that you can go get forgiveness for. It is so unbelievably convoluted and very Christian in nature. Uh, another one of the teachings here, of course, that prominates Christianity is in verse three. Now by this, we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Yeah. He says, I know him and does, he who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and has no truth in him. Wow. Uh, and these statements are made about light, truth, love, all of these things. If you've got this, you're in, you don't, you're out. But if you're born again, you got it. If you don't, you don't. And, uh, but then this, uh, born again is spoken of in here as an individual personal experience. Mm. So why do Christians teach this? Because it's in the Bible. Uh, it is, it is definitely there. 
so uh, he divides this up and uh, then begins to assault the issue. I mean, he assaults the issue of love. People think that, oh, wow, this is where we get our great revelation that God is love. Well, read about what he says about love. And you'll find out that he's talking about, uh, I honestly, Daniel, I think he's talking about just loving the Jewish brethren mm. uh, because uh, he expresses a lot of things that aren't love toward a lot of people in here. Uh, so, and then of course we have, uh, we have people around the planet trying to define what the truth of the cross is by one single statement, God is love. Mm -hmm. And therefore canceling out anything that wasn't loving. Well, you're going to have to cancel out Jesus himself because uh, Jesus got very angry. Anger is not love and love is not anger. And uh, we, gosh, we, we encourage everybody kindness. I, you know, the term love, uh, it is such a profound thing. Um, for me, and let me emphasize this for me, I don't know that I do love at all. I, I just honestly don't know. I do know when I'm kind and I do know when I'm unkind. Uh, I love being kind. I, and I don't even know if I love being kind because it makes me feel good or it helps the person. I don't even know that for sure. Uh, but I do know that kindness can become uh, addictive. I love going to the grocery store just to be kind to people, uh, encounter somebody and say something kind. And it's it really is a uh, wonderful way to live. And like I said, it makes me feel so good. I don't know if it's selfish or not, but I don't really care anymore mm -hmm. uh, because I know that people that express kindness to me, it is such a powerful thing and uh, so appreciated. And I know what they're getting, and I, I and I do not deny that I get something out of being kind. I would be a liar if I told you that my kindness was completely selfless, uh, because I know it's not. I mean, it just it feels so good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I used to use a verse out of uh, chapter three, um, and you know that He was manifest to take away our sin, mm -hmm. and in Him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Yeah. And man, I used to preach from that. But Michael, as I learned about learning in context um, and taking that verse out of context, uh, powerful statement. I agree. What I just read, I agree with. Yeah. But when you put it back into its context, Michael, I, I came to the conclusion that John was basically writing, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Exactly. Because if this is true, then... Hey, if you've done anything, <laughs> then you've never even known God. And, um, you know, which really is the powerful truth of the law. Mm -hmm. That unless you are able to hold to perfection, yeah, it, you ain't going to do it. Um, and, and that's the truth. But that's not what he was preaching here. I think Daniel is explaining to you is the difference between an exegesis and an eisegesis. Yes. Um, the eisegesis would cause us to read into this that uh, that what we we would like for it to say. An exegesis is taking a good, hearty, healthy look at what the author intended when he said it. Mm -hmm. And uh, as as Daniel told you, and I think that you guys, as you go through this, you cannot. These can be lovely verses, and I've used them to confirm that we're free from sin, as John taught in, uh, as Paul taught in Romans, so very clear in, uh, well, all of Romans, but especially chapter six, that we are completely free from sin, the last part of five and all the way through six. Uh, but I was doing right hand on uh, yellow, left hand on red, and left foot on the ceiling. You know? <laughs> I'm tall. I can do that. Um, but uh, but the the honesty and the doing exercising this exegesis, and we really do encourage you when you are reading or studying, especially the, any text in the Bible. Uh, look, why is context important? Because you you cannot understand what the author is trying to say unless you read in context. Context is not what we use to get what we want out of it. 
context is what we use and everyone should use uh, because uh, if you want to know what the author intended to say and what he is saying, you must read in context. Decades ago, I uh, coined the phrase that we are verse damned. Mm. Uh, it is no uh, truer uh, th then th than it is today. And uh, this entire planet where the Bible is concerned is verse damned. What is a verse out of context? It is an eisegesis. And because you cannot get what the author means out of one verse. And I mean, you put it on a flag, wave it around, and uh, make it say what you want it to say. Uh, see, I would like to keep those verses that Daniel uh, said. I would like to keep that and forget the rest of the book of John. But uh, if you are being a serious student of the Bible, then you must read this in context and accept, number one, he was saying this most likely just to Jewish people. And uh, as... Uh, uh, Daniel has explained to you, uh, goodness gracious, uh, he's not talking about what we wanted it mm -hmm. to talk about. No. Uh, so again, yeah, we can certainly come in here and take out statements that we want, but as a whole, uh, number one, you know, it says right in the beginning that this is to the 12 tribes. And, uh, um, you know, so we know that this is written to a Jewish audience and this is something that, uh, yeah. but that that's what it's all about. Uh, yes, and of course, um, uh, the uh, you know God is love, and there comes the whole paradigm of looking at everything through love in John, First John chapter four. We're not saying God is not love. We're saying that you cannot define define God through one characteristic, and this singular characteristic view of the scriptures, the singular characteristic of God as love view of the scriptures is one of the most blinding things to the truth of the scriptures that there can possibly be anything that you were to declare. Uh, God is righteous, right? Uh, somehow he failed to mention that God is righteous. Do we review the entire uh, scriptures through that statement? God is just. Yes, he is just. And you could take that one say, and because let me tell you, I have gone through Christianity and Christianity has gone through me by teaching the gospel of peace and they come back with that. But God is a just God. And uh, so they've taken the term justice mm -hmm. and they use it to paint God all the way through from the Hebrew scriptures all the way through Revelation that it's justice, justice, justice. And what they mean by justice is punishment for wrongdoing. And uh, so why don't you go with that one? Uh, th what we are trying to encourage the whole planet to do, if you're going to study this, don't take any single characteristic of God and uh, try to shoehorn in everything that you look at into that single characteristic. Uh, uh, is God justice? Yes, but the thing of it is, is he brought justice. Uh, is God love? Yes, God is love. But God being love is not proved out and perfected in us by keeping his commandments. Mm. Uh, if you're going to accept that God is love by this author, you're going to have to accept that if you don't keep all of God's commandments, the love of God is not perfected in you. Mm -hmm. So why view all of the scriptures through the paradigm of love when you yourself have not been impacted by that love or perfected by it, mm -hmm. according to the teaching of the author here? You know, of course, as I used to teach about love in that way, um, the conclusion here in uh, 514, now this is the confidence. What's the confidence? That if we walk in love, uh, that if we ask anything according to his yeah. will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know we will have the petitions oh. that we ask of him. And so I used to teach, if you don't have, if you're not getting your prayers answered, you yeah. better check on your love walk. Yep. And then we could come up with another list as to why you're not getting your prayers mm -hmm. answered. Uh, so uh, free, 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 free at last. Thank God Almighty, free at last. And look at how oddly... He ends this entire letter of First John, verse 21. Daniel, would you please deliver that to the people? Little children, keep 
yourself from idols. What? <laughs> uh, God is love and keep yourself from idols. <laughs> Uh, uh, folks, I just, now, if you take first John and lift things out of context, you can be very encouraged. If you read them in context, there is nothing in first John about the gospel at all. Mm -hmm. Because even when he talks about that Jesus is the Christ, he rose from the dead, he made us righteous. He's not talking about the whole world. Just like, see, these three guys, you must, must come to this understanding that according to their writings, James, Peter, and John the Elder were taking the side of, uh, they didn't mind that the Gentiles were kind of in here somewhere. And you can see that as Daniel has very aptly pointed out to you in Galatians and also in the two places in the book of Acts, uh, where there was this debate about that. And it's like, okay, okay, okay. Uh, okay, you know, if we if we have to have them Gentiles, okay. Uh, but you go to them, we'll go, we'll do our thing with, with the, the Jews. And, uh, but don't, please don't think that that is a set in stone. Paul was a missionary to the Gentiles and James and uh, uh, Peter was to the Jews. Uh, you'll see them both crossing and blurring those lines. So uh, there's nothing, uh, Jesus never sent one to one and one to the other. Uh, in fact, if you look at the testimony about Paul, what it says that what Jesus said to him, as far as what's recorded in Acts, it says I the in uh, Paul's uh, testimony about this, uh, Jesus said, "I am now calling you out of the people to whom I now send you." Mm -hmm. Well, he called him out of the Jewish people, and we see Paul ministering many times to the Jewish people, and uh, but what he was doing in most of those, just as. Uh, he did the church at Rome, which was the church that Peter started, trying to straighten out their understanding about exactly how uh, redemption has come to this world and that it's come to everybody, not to just Jews, and it didn't come through your personal faith. And uh, goodness, uh, these things are just glaringly there. These are not uh, sought out. The difference between what you've heard up until now from others and from us is that we've taken the time to let these things speak for themselves. Mm. We are doing our best to do an exegesis of all of this. And by doing that, we have let these authors speak for themselves. And we, uh, uh, and, and by doing so, uh, it has ruined some verses for us, you know? Uh, it has taken some some of my arsenal out, uh, but when I look at it honestly, I realize that those verses that I used, even like out of First Peter, uh, that uh, these are not uh, verses that were spoken to the whole world. This was a perspective that the disciples of Jesus before the cross had a perspective about a kingdom and remember this asking you know who's going to sit at your right hand when you know when we get our kingdom and uh i don't think that that mindset changed after the death burial and resurrection it sure doesn't seem that it changed because they were still waiting and they were wanting their kings and priests uh their spiritual ones to be set up in this new kingdom so by allowing it to say what it says we realize this isn't pseudographical no, but really. it is not gospel. And uh, for that reason, we separate it. We separate mm -hmm. it from the gospel because of what it teaches and uh, not because it's pseudographical. Uh, uh, second John, uh, you know, uh, if you want to look into a private letter to a lady and her children, go ahead. <laughs> I don't know what you're going to get out of it. It has 13 verses in it. Uh, and it says, the children of thy elect sister greet thee. That's the last verse. Amen. Uh, and in between, it is just simply keep the commandments, walk after the commandments. Uh, your grandma walked after the commandments. You know, your sister-in-law walked after the commandments. I'm keeping the commandments and you keep the commandments. And, uh, and your sister who obviously keeps the commandments 
So you said, hey. And don't let anyone in your house that doesn't keep the commandments. Don't let anybody in your house. <laughs> Daniel, what are you doing here? <laughs> uh, um, third John. You know, we used to teach, uh, well, oh, I, I won't say we, but I, I know I yeah, did. Yeah, you can wait us off, on this one. Offering verses out of this one. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health even as your soul prospers. Yeah. It, it's just a greeting, folks. <laughs> and your reason you're not prospering is because your soul not prospering. And your soul will be prospering if you start giving. <laughs> and if we would have taken it in context, Michael, we couldn't have used it as an uh, a offering scripture. Because look at verse 7. Because they went forth for his name's sake, taking nothing from the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to use it as offer, you're not supposed to take anything from the Gentiles. And Michael, uh, frankly, our congregations were mostly Gentile. I think I'm almost 100% in most uh, churches. So uh, I, I don't know why all these great preachers don't take uh, 1 John chapter 3 to heart and say don't ever take up an offering from Gentiles. <laughs> You know, the Jews got all the money anyway. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's the accusation. Uh, I hope they do. They deserve it. Jeez. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, Third John, um, uh, you know, there's just, there's nothing here. This is a private letter, and it should have stayed that way. <laughs> yeah, kind of like we saw with Philemon. Um, but to, that was a letter that Paul wrote. Yeah. Now, Jude. Oh. That's a damning one. Hey, Jude. <laughs> Quit condemning me. Take uh, your sad song and go someplace else. <laughs> Jude 1.4. For certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. Mm. Ungodly men who turn the grace of our Lord into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Jude's mad at everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, he is ticked off about everything. And uh, uh, there's spots in your love feast. Yeah. <laughs> and but you're supposed to pray in tongues a lot so that you can be built up. Mm. Uh, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, looking for it. <laughs> I have to admit to you, I don't look for the mercy of God. I mm. look to the scriptures to see where the mercy of God was given. And Paul's teaching, who said that God declared all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. What are you looking for? Mm. And here's the mercy. Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of the <laughs> saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who were mm. ungodly among mm. them, mm. all their ungodly deeds which have committed in an ungodly way and all the harsh things which the ungodly sinners have spoken against him. How many times can you use the word ungodly in one, in one verse or in one sentence? Jesus. Uh, you know, uh, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness and darkness forever. And that's people who teach grace. Wow. That's what this warning was about. You know, why do we jest? Why why, why is it uh, funny to us? Because we understand it's very serious. And people have gotten a lot of, I lived in fear out of this book goodness. for a long time. And I understand that. Uh, but we have come to learn that this this is just foolish. There's no gospel here. This is This is not what Jesus came to do. Um, you know, he even says in, in this book that there's some that are going to be saved by fear. Yeah. Um, and that's not the gospel. No. And uh, we just think it is <laughs> hilarious because it, it's yeah. so unreal. It's we, we don't even live in that world anymore. No. And you know how they say about a joke, you know, too soon? <laughs> no, this is not too soon. This has been 2,000 years. Yeah. It's about time we had a good ha-ha about this. Mm -hmm. uh, because if we don't laugh about it, it's going to kill us. Yeah. And it's going to be the justification for murder and slaughter around the planet. So, yes, we laugh at it. Uh, it's not just because it's uh, laughable. 
uh, because it's it, it's 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 time. Mm -hmm. You know, get together, have have a church service, and laugh at uh, at pseudographicals and laugh at uh, Peter, James, and John uh, because it's it's laughable uh, to compare their writings to the glorious gospel wow. of the Lord Jesus Christ is laughable. Mm. And for that reason, we separate it from the yeah. gospel because it is, it's laughable. Yeah. Well, we are moving right along here, um, but we're coming to dun, 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 the revelation. Yes. I thought we just did this, Michael. Boy, we did this. This was the whole last conference wow. that we did was on the revelation. So to say that we have uh, paid our dues here, uh, would be a uh, understatement. We did at least eight sessions, I think, yeah, on this. Least, I don't yeah. remember how many, but uh, uh, at that time, it was the most sessions we had ever done in a conference. This one, of course, is taking its place, and we are not trying to do more the next time. We <laughs> want to do the briefest conference possible <laughs> when we cut, when this uh, comes back around, uh, and uh, we will get it back down to... Uh, this is uh, Friday night, this is uh, Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, Saturday night, and Sunday. So five to six sessions uh, varies on, uh, you know, uh, the way things were going in the conference uh, when we were in Calgary, whether we did five or six. So, uh, and five or six was just almost an overload uh, back then. I mean, the things that we were learning were uh, so powerful and now to get through and get past some of these major, major uh, misinterpretations uh, and misguided efforts to share these things, uh, the revelation I had, uh, I had ha ha that revelation. Mm -hmm. uh, I had mocked revelation, and then uh, cursed at it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I, I forced myself. I just like, I am not worth my salt as a Bible teacher if I don't look at this. And I finally had a study buddy who would, uh, was crazy enough to go into this with me. And my goodness, the things that we learned, we want to really encourage you because we are not going to teach the book of Revelation because this is our last session. And uh, we have no intentions of teaching the revelation, but we did need to go back just number one for the benefit of having this in this uh, in this particular conference on the pseudographicals, but also to uh, look, I think we've been able to affirm a little bit more strongly because you remember at the end of the revelation, it kind of got thrown at us at the min uh, last minute about the pseudographicals at the end and it just popped out and there it was i don't even remember exactly where we said it was but we've since then given it more of proper time and attention now please understand that during the process of this we have not taught you uh all the things that uh need to be taught there's things about Jesus sitting on the right hand of the throne of God that need to be taught. We see it better than we ever have before, but we're not prepared to teach on it. It is a subject that is throughout. It is in the Hebrew scriptures. It's in uh, the gospels. It's in uh, Paul's teachings. It's in uh, Hebrews. Uh, it's in the disciples' uh, teachings. Uh, so the... It is definitely there, but we are uh, learning. We are learning. And we are still trying to measure out this whole thing about the thousand year reign. We have a persuasion that we have not gone into detail about that uh, because it is by default almost has to be this, that the thousand year reign is from uh, King David to the cross. Uh, even the book of Psalms where that was written was a thousand. I was reading, I, I was reading in Psalms and I thought it was the Psalm of David. And I thought, when was this written? And, uh, I looked and he was talking about the rain, uh, that was, uh, of the throne of, uh, of his own throne. 
And uh, when I looked back and uh, went into just a Google search, I found out that, that uh, the Psalms where he was talking about was written 1,000 uh, before Christ. And the throne of David began 1,000 years before Christ. Uh, Al Vitale brought up a question to me, which is very valid, and we've just not had the time to look into it. It uh, Because what it says uh, pertaining to that is that uh, they lived and reigned with him uh, during this thousand years. I don't have a clue, Al, uh, but uh, what that's actually saying. Uh, there's evidently something that we have not seen in the scriptures yet. Uh, we, this may be something we'll never understand. We are comfortable with not knowing what we don't know. You must become comfortable with not knowing what you don't know or you'll make things up trying to save face. We don't need to save face here. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, goodness gracious, uh, this is not about us saving face or looking good or being admired by anybody as doing anything. Uh, we truly are only wanting to extract truth out of this. And this has been, I tell you, we've worked hard. <laughs> you know, most of the conferences I could tell you, you know, gosh, people think I study really hard for this and I don't, you know, it's just, there, we had so much fresh understanding of the gospel and everything was so easy. You just, you know, open your Bible and point and start teaching uh, from the perspective of the gospel and it always turned out great. Uh, these, we have had to be very diligent in our research. So now we are going to take you into the last of this conference and uh, so that uh, you can know at least our opinion about the pseudographical writings of the Revelation. Please though, go and uh, go onto the website and uh, type in in the search bar, the Revelation, and you will get all of that. Don Bartlett uh, did an incredible job in teaching, Don taught with us on that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, he gave us such great insights into these letters. So Daniel, get us started here. The first thing to remember when you go to the Revelation, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Yes. It's not a revelation of the seven churches. It's not a revelation of how we should act or how we should behave. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And mm -hmm. by holding true to that idea, we were able to wade through all of this imagery. Uh, yes. Now, there's so much more that we have yet to grow in and understand on that imagery, but by seeing that it is the revelation of Jesus and not a revelation of us, uh, mm -hmm. again, as we've been learning about in exegesis, is taking ourselves out of it uh, and just seeing Christ. Mm -hmm. um, and what you see, as we're about to show you in the pseudographical section, it's not about Christ. It's all about the people and their works. Yeah. And uh, so as we go into the revelation, remember that's it's the revelation of Jesus. And remember also, it's not a multiple revelations of Jesus. There's one single mm -hmm. revelation, and that revelation is of Christ. One revelation, and it is only of him and only one revelation about him. Did I say that right? Did I say revelations? Or are you just adding on? No, you did you said it right. Yeah, because you know, I said. No, I just making sure. What'd you say? What'd you, say? <laughs> you know, because we always used to say the book of Revelations. Yes. Yeah, but no, it's the Revelation. You did it right, Daniel. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, verse one: the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place, and he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keeps those things which are written in it for the time is near. Now, before we jump ahead, uh, I want to remind you that we're about to see the time frame in which this is written. Um, oh, the John says that I was in the spirit in the Lord's day. Mm -hmm. So when it says that these things are shortly to come to pass, he's not, yes, the, the writing took place after the cross, but he's writing about events that he was saying from his 
perspective from standing before the cross. And the angel was saying, here is what's happening. Yeah. Uh, John had this incredible experience. The veil was rent behind him, but it was kind of rent in front of him too. Mm. Uh, that veil that was rent behind him went into the temple, uh, the earthly temple, and the veil that was rent in front of him went into the heavenly temple. So he got to see into the heavenly temple and the uh -huh. imagery that was given him is just utterly amazing and to think that I missed this all of these years. Uh, we also want to point out to you that verse 3 says that you need to read the words of this prophecy. Uh, some of this stuff comes up as not prophecy at all. So that's our first indication that there uh, might be something wrong with this because these letters are not prophecy. Uh, these letters are... Uh, Jesus is mad at everybody. Mm. Take a song. So, uh, verse four, John to the seven churches, which are in Asia. Yeah. Grace to you and peace from him. Listen to this phrase. Who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits, which are before the throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth. To him whom loved us and washed us from our sin is in his own blood and made us kings and priests to his oh God my goodness. and Father. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he's coming quickly with the clouds and every eye will see him. Even they who pierced him, all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. And listen to this phrase again. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Well, Daniel, you just blew me away. I did not realize, you know, we've made comment uh, several times about this kings and priests and how that uh, in uh, that Peter was uh, seeing this kings and priests as something that was coming up after the second coming. And here we find, uh, uh, whether or not this was Peter or followers of Peter, we find the fingerprint of Peter right here in the Revelation. Wow. Uh, and, and in what we are able to see as Sudgraf, do you see the clear division I'm glad they put that big old capital J here in my Bible <laughs> uh, because it really divides that from verse 1, 2, and 3 and verse 4, 5, 6, uh, 7, and 8 uh, are totally different. So you have the uh, introduction to the revelation. Suddenly there's an interruption to the revelation to the churches, seven churches that are at Asia. <clears throat> and also, uh, and I've got to read that again, and hath made us kings and priests unto our God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Wow. Unbelievable. So the very first, uh, there is a signature here of uh, the pseudographical that is, uh, uh, we want to point out to you, and it is this statement, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. This gets stated uh, several times, but only in the very first of this and then only in the very last part of the last chapter. I think it is mentioned one time, but it's like, you remember the big worship service in heaven? Oh, yes, Worthy yes, yes. is the one who was and is and is to come. But other than that, these are the only times it's used. So so what was, what then happened was that they lifted that statement out of the middle of this and to to shoelace this that to me that's only a verification even more verification of how desperate they were to try to uh shoelace these statements at the first and at the end of this into the statements of this revelation so then he goes on in verse nine and we propose to you that this is actually john yeah. i john both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdoms and patience of Jesus Christ was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God, for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. Now, uh, then this starts saying again, I'm the alpha and the omega. Now, if you're going to tie this into the middle of this and to 
try to insert something. What a better statement to use repetitively other than I am the alpha and the omega. Now, uh, according to our research, and we're not going, like I said, we're not going to teach the revelation to you again today. All you have to do is press a button and you can hear it all. Our teaching, Don Bartlett's teaching in it, uh, which we have uh, uh, been able to add to that last conference that we did. And you can see here that uh, something starts different. And then uh, that's where my red letter, everything turns blood red from here on <laughs> in. And uh, then begins this letter to the churches. There's a little bit where he says, I turned and the voice spake unto me and behold, I saw seven candlesticks. Now, uh, we want to show you something. This one says, I heard the trumpet, and then he turned and saw a bunch of candlesticks. Uh, in the midst of the seven candlesticks, under the Son of Man, clothed in garment, his hair was, and it was this, and his feet was brass and beard, and, then, and he had uh, in his right hand seven stars out of went uh, two-edged sword, and uh, countenance was that that's shining with an angel. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his hand upon me and said unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am the Alpha, the Omega, and, and all of that. Uh, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I'm alive. And, um, uh, and then goes into this. And the only thing we're going to point out to you is that these seven churches, uh, goodness gracious, their works, their works, their works, their works. And by the way, did I mention their works, as Don Bartlett would say unto you? Um, behold, I say unto you, Don Bartlett, it sounded rather spiritual, didn't it? Hallelujah. And uh, the one that got me, I, you know, I know everybody's got their gotcha in this. It's like, holy Moses, I can't believe they did that, uh, was his uh, remarks about the Nicolaitans. I just hate the work of the Nicolaitans. Uh, you can see Catholicism definitely uh, embedded into this. Because one of the descriptions of the Nicolaitans were that they practiced uh, married clergy was oh, uh, no. one of their practices. Can you believe it? And God hated that? <laughs> God hated married clergy. <laughs> <laughs> so all of you uh, uh, Protestant preachers uh, that are not priests, God hates you. <laughs> <laughs> And we can prove it. So until you get a divorce and annul everything, there's no reason for you to even stay a preacher because Jesus hates married ministers. Mm. Uh, that one just blew me away. And all I had to do was do a, a word search on Nicolaitans and what that meant, uh, do an etymology search on that. And boy, you're going to find out what Jesus really hated about these people. So, uh, so blah, 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 blah. Read that if you like. Um, then uh, what we're going to do, Daniel, is try to find where this picks up after. Let's see if there's a difference. Now, in this one, it says that he heard a great voice as of a trumpet. And then, of course, I'm Alpha and Omega. Doesn't that confirm that this is uh, all a part of this revelation? But let's try this out. And the, my red letter edition ends in verse 22 of Revelation chapter 3. And uh, the last verse, verse 22, uh, uh, well, let's read 21 and 22. Uh, let's go 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and I will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me and my throne even as I have overcome. That kind of goes back to kings and priests, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And am set down with my father in his throne, uh, and he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith in the churches. I'd also like to point out, as you listen to the teaching or the reading and the understanding of the revelation, uh, we see very clearly where New Jerusalem is coming down with the throne of God in the middle of it, and the New Jerusalem came in right down in the middle of us. And so we know where that throne is, and this is uh, this is saying that you have to that he's outside knocking to come in. 
The revelation says it placed him in us. This has him outside knocking to come in. Man, I use, I burn my feet off telling people that. <laughs> and uh, to him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, just like I overcame. Uh, God, now you gotta do everything Jesus did. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto these churches. Uh, Daniel, I'm going to read the last part of this, and let's do like we did on that uh, one in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and then you started reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 after we did this same type of research. And uh, I'm going to read two verses and then let's see if this even makes sense to pick this up again in chapter four. All right, so what it says in Revelation chapter one, verse nine, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle of, that is called Patmos for the word of God. And this is true. They, we do know that historically that John was sent to the isle of Patmos and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. After these things, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying, come up here and I will wow. show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne set in heaven and one sat on the throne. I, if you lay these out, and we encourage you to do that, lay these out, read that, and try to read into the churches Jesus don't like. And then lay it out and read this. Of course, we're going to do this for you. We're going to eventually publish all of this. And uh, so it's uh, you'll be able to read uh, right straight into this. Uh, it's just going to be marvelous to be able to do that. But this is obviously, and see, just as I was telling you before, that uh, John was standing there and behind him, the curtain was being rent from top to bottom. And in front of him, uh, uh, the trumpet went off behind him and the vision started taking place in front of him. And this is just such beautiful imagery in and of itself that uh, the curtain was rent and the veil was opened. Oh, my goodness. And uh, then, uh, does it say here he heard a trumpet coming out of there also? Yeah, it was a voice as of a trumpet. All right. So he hears the trumpet behind him. The veil rents. He looks in front of him. The veil opens and another trumpet sounds. Um. Uh, I got chills. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm all to play. <laughs> and I'm losing control. <laughs> Long time. <laughs> so then after that point, Michael, we have this beautiful revelation. And again, we're not going to go through it. But if you want that information, we did go verse by verse. We read the entire thing in the last conference. So uh, check that out. But if we go back now to the end of... Um, the revelation. Michael, how about I read the first five verses of chapter 22, which Let's is, do that. this is the culmination of the revelation. And he showed me a pure river of water, a water of life, clear as crystal, <laughs> proceeding from the throne of God and of the lamb in the middle of its street. And on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. <laughs> And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb of God shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no more light. There, you're messing with me. <laughs> <laughs> there no need for lamp, nor light, nor the sun, but the Lord God gives them the light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Together, equally, no hierarchy, none of that mm. is here at all. Uh, yeah, uh, for uh, you'll have to pardon my charades going on while uh, <laughs> Daniel was reading. 
Uh, but I'm just seeing this, you know, and it's like, wow, this is that we don't, we need to not let go of what this is actually saying at the end of this revelation. This is what this said all the way through here. And that's all he's capping off here is mm. what has already been said. And what do we see? It's done. It's finished. It's here. It's established. It's all of that. Um, and what we're about to see is something totally different than that. Something happens drastically here. Verse six. Then he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord God and the holy prophet sent his angel to show his servant the things which must shortly take place. What? We went through all that and now we're back to shortly take place. <laughs> Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who reads the words of this prophecy of this book. I just went back right before we got on here. I thought, well, what does quickly mean for God's sakes? And uh, every place that the word quickly meant, it's used about eight or nine times or so in the New Testament. Uh, and it, it tells about how they quickly did this and they quickly did that. And uh, they, uh, they quickly ran here or whatever. But quickly kind of means quickly. <laughs> <laughs> And I don't think uh, 2,023 years is qualifies as quickly uh, based on the other places in the New Testament this word was used. Mm. Now I, John, saw and heard these things. And when I heard, I saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Then he said to me, see that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant. And of your brethren, the prophets and those who keep the words of this book, worship God. And he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. And I am the oh, and I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the last, the first and the last. Wow. Blessed is he who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life Wow! and may enter through the gates of the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexual immoral, immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. You know, this is so uh, opposite. The, to the revelation has all this inside of us. Mm. And now we have Jesus standing outside in the first part of this, uh, knocking to come in. And uh, here uh, he's describing a city we're trying to get into. Uh, it's just completely opposite to the revelation, to say the least. Wow. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches, the seven churches. Mm -hmm. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and the morning star, and the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him who hears say, come, and let him who thirst come, whoever desires, let him take of the living water freely, of life freely. For I testify to everyone who hears the word of this prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of this book, of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the book of life, from the, I want to stop Michael, I, I don't want my name taken from the book of life, and from well, the holy city, oh, I think it's too late, <laughs> <laughs> and from the things which are written in this book. He who testifies these things says, surely I'm coming quickly, amen, even so, come Lord Jesus, the grace of our Lord Christ be with you all, amen. And amen is amen. And that is the amen to this conference also. Um, I'm in a bit of uh, shock. Mm. Um, it is a almost otherworldly feeling. Um, if I were to try to describe what I feel, I would be incapable of doing that. Uh, I am so grateful. Uh, and, and first off to you folks in Canada, uh, you have honored me beyond what any man would ever deserve. 
uh, you have treated me so graciously. And you know that's against the backdrop of other things. Uh, the, the, the friendships that I have amongst you, and yes, we've missed you also, <clears throat> but um, for, you've got to understand, especially those of you who are there in Canada and who've attended these conferences, uh, there's no way we would have been at this point where we have just finished this research in the pseudographicals. There's no possible way without you. And we're not talking about the financial support. We're talking about you uh, setting and listening and absorbing and challenging and asking questions. You know, our sessions, when we do them there in, uh, in person, I could, uh, many times I talked for an hour and then answered questions or had discussion uh, for an hour and a half. And then we had sessions where that we did nothing but talk about what was taught and exchange ideas and thoughts. I've grown so much through doing that. And you all have been such a great part of uh, my existence on this planet. And I have, uh, I, I just, I'm, I'm just grateful. I don't even know how to express to you uh, what I feel uh, inside and what's happening in me at this very moment. And have my friend, uh, Daniel, here doing this with me. Nobody deserves this uh, much uh, kindness. I, I just got nothing but kindness from you guys, and I really appreciate it. It's been wonderful spending this conference with you, and now I'm going to let D uh, Daniel take his time to say goodbye. Uh, but I'm saying to you right now, we, uh, goodbye from Michael Lilborn Williams right here in the Queen City in Clarksville, Tennessee. Yeah, I too. I am just so thankful and grateful. I want to say I'm thankful for the Gospel Revolution, for Michael, for Don, for Glenn, for all of those in Calgary. Um, just a big, huge thank you for being a part of my life. Um, if it weren't for you, I, I would be caught up in John's teachings. Uh, I would still be in uh, preaching Jude, uh, the fiery. I would be preaching that the revelation is yet something to happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it was because of what I learned here at the Gospel Revolution uh, that I am where I am. Uh, and I, not only am I grateful for myself, but I think about my two little girls. Oh, my two little girls are going to raise up in a home where, yes, of course, they're going to have the right to choose whatever they want. Um, but they're not going to be burdened down and indoctrinated with some Christian doctrine. Uh, that's going to cause them torment in their mind. Uh, and if I can do anything to do that... And it's because of what I've learned uh, here at the Gospel Revolution. So uh, thank you so much for just being there and making sure that this is something that goes on and continues. And uh, to all of you out there in 2525, wow, uh, this, is, this is history. This is part of history uh, that has taken place. And I hope uh, by the time you're watching this video, uh, that there are many other Daniels and Naomi's and Evelinas yeah. who have come in to learn the gospel. And uh, we are hoping that the gospel is changing the world. Absolutely. We know the gospel will change the world. Uh, the issue is, is it out there? Mm. And that's going to be up to you guys. And uh, we do appreciate that. Uh, you know, uh, one of the reasons we ended with uh, the year 2525, that's one of my uh, early years songs in the year 2020, 2025, will man still be alive? Uh, will woman be able to survive? You know, so, <laughs> and we want you to know, even though that uh, that song was around uh, in our time, that we knew you guys were gonna be there in 2025. And we knew that man would still be alive and woman would survive. Michael, we did it. Matthew through <laughs> Revelation, we have um, at least drawn some lines where the uh, pseudographia is, where non-gospel stuff is. And uh, wow. I, I only got one thing to say to you. Dude, you crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again, everybody. Uh, make sure that you participate. If, if you just watched this session, 
look, listen, there's so much more to watch. So go back and check it out. Check out the Revelation series that we did last <laughs> year. I think you'll enjoy it. Yeah, exactly. Wow. <laughs> If you're not saying that by now, then uh, you're not listening because I'm listening now and I'm going, wow. And it was Daniel and I who did it. So uh, goodness gracious, uh, this conference uh, will go down in history, no doubt. There's absolutely no doubt of that. Do you realize that this is the first time someone has put it all on the line? left it all on the table, left it on the field. I get my sports metaphors mixed up, so we may be teeing up for the final field goal here. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, we are, uh, goodness, as you can hear already, uh, no one has ever done this as we have uh, shared with you. And what we want to do is uh, immediately after this conference is over is to pursue the publication of this. Now, we are not going to eliminate the pseudographicals. We are going to simply segregate them, put them in the back uh, of the uh, publication, and we'll put uh, Peter, James, and John, and all of the other guys in there. Uh, but what we're wanting to do is to uh, discover the teachings of Paul in their purity without anyone else's voice being heard in them. You've read it. You already know you can read through Paul's teaching and all of a sudden it's just somebody else. Now, we've seen that too, like most everybody around the planet has that has done any avid research or just listening constantly. But that's not what we made our decisions on. We went into studying the Greek that changed and how that the, uh, just the structure of uh, the way it's being presented, uh, everything changed, not just the tone, uh, even though the tone uh, does change in these. And the thing that uh, I am looking forward to is you being able to hear the Apostle Paul speak for himself for the first time in about 2,000 years. Wow. Think of that. The world now gets to hear the Apostle Paul speak himself without interjection from anyone else, all by himself, uninterrupted, we give Paul the platform. Will you give us the support to help us do that? We want to do that. We also want to do take Paul's letters then and then do a proper translation of those letters. Several people have done this and we may draw on some of their work. Uh, we're wanting to do a uh, word for word and thought for thought in an exegesis uh, manner of doing this translation. We are not going to do an eisegesis. That's what you get in Mirror Bible is you get an eisegesis where that Francois is inserting himself and his personality. Francois is a wonderful romantic. He is a poet and he has an idea and he has done an exegesis of the New Testament and inserted his thoughts it is not a, uh, it is by no means a translation on any level. It is simply uh, Francois inserting an idea that he has. Not a bad idea. It's just not the truth. Uh, so uh, help us. This needs to be out in the public. This needs to be available. And you need to be able to read it through and through. And so do I.